Hey, before we get started with the show, we want to let you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is sponsored by Audible.com. That's right. They have more than 180,000 audiobooks and spoken word audio products. They're the leading audiobook publishers, and you can choose such comics-related titles as Sean Howe's Marvel Comics, The Untold Story, and David Haydu's The Tencent Plague. Get a free audiobook of your choice at www.audibletrial.com slash comics alternative. That's audibletrial.com slash comics alternative and get started today. This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Megs Fitzgerald. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, I have the pleasure of talking with Megs Fitzgerald. Her new book, Long Red Hair, came out just the other month. But before we get to that conversation, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There you'll find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, the discounts will be 20 to 35% off cover price, and every single month you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off cover price, sometimes at 50% off of the cover price, but often the discounts go higher from there. That's right, and this month, as in every month, they offer a load of bundles where you can take advantage of getting multiple comics from the same publisher that you would uh, at a deeper discount than you would get if you bought those comics individually. Uh, they have bun- 50% off bundles this month from Marvel, DC, including DC Vertigo, and Valiant. Yeah, so they have great specials. you got to go to their website and check them out. That's dcbservice.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Andy, I had a great time talking with Megs Fitzgerald the other day. Um, I, I met her back in September at Small Press Expo. And I got the opportunity to talk with her for a few minutes there, and it, it was on one of those interview shows from SPX that uh, Wolverton and I did. Uh, but this was a much more involved, longer conversation that we had wanted to do. Uh, now, uh, last year she came out with a book, uh, Photo Booth, a biography, which was fascinating because it's all about the history and the technology behind photo booths. But it's also a lot about her own life and her relationship with photo booths. Now, her new book, which came out in September, Long Red Hair, is definitely about her life. In fact, this is a memoir of the early part of her life growing up. So uh, I had a great time talking with Megs, and I hope you will enjoy it as well. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. I'm happy to have on the Comics Alternative, Megs Fitzgerald. Her new book, Long Red Hair, came out in September. Megs, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And I want to start off by wishing you a happy Friday the 13th. Uh, <laughs> and we, we're recording this on November, Friday the 13th. And the reason that I'm wishing uh, you that uh, is because of what we learn in Long Red Hair. Yes, exactly. Good Good remembering. I um, 
I just actually made a note to myself to text my parents because in our family, it's a, a tradition to wish each other a happy 13th, whether it's a, a Friday or not, because uh, my parents actually met on a Friday the 13th at a church dance when they were teenagers. And, 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 you know, not only is that an interesting fact uh, about, you know, your biography, but also it plays into the overall theme of Long Red Hair, and that is you feeling yourself or maybe feeling that others may see you as a little different. So, and I can't remember which friend it is you wish a happy Friday 13th to, but I think when you do in the book, they kind of look at you askew for a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it comes up in a conversation with a character in the book that's named Elise. Um, so Elise is based on a real friend, but her, I changed her name for the book just to sort of protect her privacy. Um, but that sort of, uh, kind of a little bit off, a little bit weird, uh, kind of stuff is, is pretty common within my family. And so some of that is captured within the book. Hmm. Now, I want to talk about uh, Elise, your friend, as well as some of the other key moments in Long Red Hair. But before we do, um, maybe start off with a broader question, and that is, what does Long Red Hair, not necessarily as a title, mean to you? So Long Red Hair for me was a symbol from the time that I was very young that represented to me that I was attracted to women, because I just continually kept finding myself to be extra captivated by women with long red hair, uh, particularly if it was extra wavy and voluminous and, and curly. And uh, so that was a strong signal for me, something that I had to listen to for me to start shaping my identity around. Um, but as an adult, I see it somewhat differently because I think that when we have such a, a singular thing like that, like hair, that we uh, shape our attraction around that we're in danger of uh, fetishizing people and objectifying people. And so uh, it becomes a bit more of a, a complex issue, though I still do think it's a very nice trait that someone could have. And in fact, uh, as you were saying that, I was looking at the opening pages of the book, and it begins in 1992. And at the very end of this uh, opening scene, you're watching – we see you watching the movie, uh, you know, Who Framed Roger Rabbit – and uh, on this particular page, it's the last one from 1992, you, uh, they're, they're close-ups of you with the remote, and it appears like you keep going back to the image of Jessica Rabbit with that long red hair and, of course, with the unrealistic volu voluptu voluptuous <laughs> shape. Uh, so, you know, talk about objectification and fetishization. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what Jessica Rabbit is all about. Yeah, absolutely. And she, I think, has been the object of many people's crushes and desires over the years, um, for for better or for worse. But uh, I think that she actually, as a symbol, is, is pretty relatable to a lot of people because she's she's ingrained in our in our psyches, whether we we think of her often or not. Right. Uh, now we've been talking about your book, Long Red Hair, and what red hair has meant to you. Um, let, let's give our listeners a, a better sense of what your new book is about. Uh, so if you could, you know, describe it to someone, let's say the uninitiated. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially the book is a graphic memoir and it is a coming of age story for me about coming up queer and, um, and how I slowly realized that and how my story is unique from other people's is that I didn't grow up in a homophobic environment. Um, so I, I went to a, an alternative art school that was incredibly supportive. I, I have parents that have many um, close friends who are gay and lesbian. And, and so I always knew that I'd be accepted. And yet there's still a lot of struggles that go along with recognizing that you're different. Um, so that's a big portion of the book. And then another part of the book is also allusions to witchcraft and popular culture and in history that I weave in and out and how that also ties in with red hair. Now, um, this is interesting. I, I said that if you could explain this for the uninitiated, those who listen to this podcast should remember you from a show we did a couple of months ago when I was at Small Press Expo and met you. And then we had a brief conversation. You talked a little bit about the book then. Now, one of the main differences for me, at least, is at the time, 
I had not read Long Red Hair. You had copies of it there at, yeah. the, at the convention. My problem, as I told you, is I had ordered the book from the place where I get my comics, which is Discount Comic Book Service, which, by the way, is the sponsor for this uh, podcast. That's right. And it was in the mail on the way. So I didn't have the benefit of having read it when I talked to you. So now um, you know, I, I know what you're talking about here. So – the witchcraft, when you were talking about it back in September, I was wondering how it figured into your overall story. But then after reading the memoir, it just makes perfect sense because you're talking about this being a story about um, – you know, you're you're coming to realize yourself as queer, and in fact, the 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 very concept of naming yourself or how you felt uh, becomes a, a subject in the book as well. Because at one point you call yourself bisexual, then you realize that that's a little awkward, that that comes with its own kind of baggage, um, and it, it, but it comes down to this this more general feel. It, this is what I took away uh, from the memoir. Of just being different, and that's also where the witchcraft part came in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that's definitely part of the the witchcraft in that um, for for millennia now that w women who have been recognized as different or empowered in a, a threatening way um, they have been subjugated and you know persecuted. So whether they were witches um, or whether they were just outspoken women in their community, there's been some sort of consequence for most of history for women who, who behave that way. Um, and so in the book, I'm relating to that, but I'm also finding the power of recognizing that it's okay that you don't feel like you fit with the norm. Um, and particularly from the perspective of being a child and seeing witches and sort of macabre and um, things that belong to the occult, you know, in, in pop culture, like, uh, like Buffy and like Sabrina, the teenage witch and charmed and even hocus pocus um, that film. So seeing those things and uh, being especially drawn to them because this sort of sense of difference or even a little bit of danger was, was appealing and it's um, in the way that it navigated away from the mainstream. In fact, you were mentioning those popular films. One of the things I really appreciate about your book is that in the back, you provide a film and television reference for those who may not recognize some of the scenes. And so, you know, you mentioned Buffy and then Sabrina. There's also The Princess Bride, Labyrinth, Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhand. And, you know, all of these films have something in common. They deal with difference and they deal with the macabre. And so even if someone didn't know all of the references, I'm sure they could pick up on th those pop cultural visual references as feeding into your theme. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that um, in, in some ways it limits the experience for some readers because uh, those films of course are, you know, more geared towards a Western market. And so other people may not understand those references. And uh, there are some people who are, you know, maybe 15 years old and reading the book and have no idea what those references are. Um, but I think that for people who are sort of within my age range and older who are familiar with those things, it, those extra references really um, can really make the book hit home at certain points because I don't have to say how I felt. I can just relate to what sort of media I was absorbing and, and people get the feeling of that media. That, that's interesting. You know, I hadn't thought of these film and TV references as being limited or limiting in terms of your your readers. But but you're right. I, I thought of it more a, a, as a positive way because what it does is it certainly anchors you in a particular place and time. And mm -hmm. this being your story, that just made sense to me. But have you had readers come up to you, uh, maybe younger or even older uh, readers, and say – they didn't get the reference or there's something about those films that just didn't resonate with them. Um, no one has said that. And so, but I can only suspect that someone who doesn't get why the references are there wouldn't know to think why they don't get them, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so I've had some reviews where the reviewer was really obsessed with the, uh, with the references and they sort of wanted to pick apart the meaning of each of them being in there, which was great. And then I've had other reviews that didn't mention it at all. And then I've had some reviews that, um, seem to be written by somebody who just like, you know, is middle-aged and not queer and a man 
and who didn't grow up watching the same things as me. And he was paid to write that review. And so he just wrote it, but he doesn't really have a, a foundation for the kind of, um, a foundation of the sort of knowledge that I would expect most of my readers finding the book who are naturally drawn to the book would have. Well, that's funny. The way that you described that one male reviewer uh, would actually <laughs> describe me, except I'm not getting <laughs> yeah. paid. Um, right, right. But Well, and so I, I should say, too, I for a little while, if I got a review that I didn't agree with or I just didn't like how some things were phrased or, or what have you, I would um, I'd be like, oh, well, whatever. I, I don't have to really take this to heart because this reviewer is some straight middle-aged white man. And then I actually started getting some very kind, thoughtful, very well-written reviews from straight middle-aged white men. And so I couldn't use that as my, as sort of my defense mechanism anymore. I was like, oh no, actually, I think this, this book can appeal to a lot of people, whether or not you happen to be my age and my sex and my orientation. I think, I think the appeals are, the appeal is wider than that. Oh yeah. Now you're, you're talking about the kind of reception that the book has been receiving um, um, it, it, as a whole. How has it been? It's been uh, very positive. It's been um, it's been overwhelming in how uh, kind it's been. Um, with Photo Booth, that also received a lot of positive attention, but it came over a, a much slower period of time. It was very gradual because it was my first book. Um, I'm speaking of Photo Booth biography, so uh, I didn't expect with Long Red Hair for the response to be so immediate. Um, and so quick. So I, I got one review in particular that really sort of set things off. And that was on Autostraddle, which is a feminist website. And the review was written by a lesbian trans woman. And she just really related to the material. It really spoke to her. And so she wrote a, a really uh, incredibly personal review of the book. It, it actually brought me to tears reading it because that's my goal as a creator is to connect with an audience. And clearly I had made this connection to her. And that review spoke to a lot of people. So um, after that, I sold out on Amazon uh, in the States and in Canada and sold a few dozen copies of my book through my own Etsy page where people can buy them signed and inscribed. So um, that was that was really very touching. And so um, that makes me that makes all the work that you put into a book worthwhile when you realize you are finding your audience and you are finding like minded people. Now, this is interesting because um, you'd mentioned that the, the kind of reaction you're getting from Long Red Hair is different and quicker than it was with Photo Booth. Uh, and, and you said that it might have something to do with the fact that this is your second book. Do you think it may have something also to do with this being an autobiography or a memoir and Photo Booth, even though – and I want to get to that eventually. I, I do think that that is like a memoir. Uh, but do you, but it, it seems a, a little different, more like a history uh, in in certain ways. Uh, so you think it's the autobiographical element that resonates with uh, with readers this time around? I do, I do. I think for sure that people, um, and this is true for myself. When I see myself in somebody else's work, the world feels a little tighter and a little softer, and it's it's just nice knowing that there are people out there who share your same perspective. So. Um, Many readers have, have reached out and, and let me know how special it was to them. So, um, And that happened with Photo Booth as well a, a fair bit, but it, it just happened over the course of many months, whereas with Long Red Hair, and it's only been out for a month and a half now. Um, it's only been in bookstores for just over a month. And um, so it, the, the immediacy of everything has is, is really struck me. Yeah, it, it feels so different to not have the book out in the world compared to having the book out in the world. <laughs> Now, in, in terms of your reading material when it comes to graphic novels or comics, whatever you choose to call them, um, are they usually autobiographical comics? Because, I mean, that is a very large field. You'll find uh, many examples of those, it, from, at least from my experience, more times than not, when people who don't know much about comics, if they're familiar with graphic novels or comics at all, it's usually an autobiography or a memoir in, in mm -hmm. comics form. Yeah, the books that I'm most drawn to are all memoirs. Um, and I it actually took me a long time to realize that. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, wait a second. This is the stuff that I just keep buying over and over again. Um, of course, there's so many other genres of books that I really love as well. But um, but those just kind of be the ones I, I, t I tend to keep coming back to, um, as well as works by female creators. You know, I, I wouldn't say it's a, a strong, deliberate choice on my part to read um 
mostly only women, but I actually do just tend to read mostly only works by women. So, yeah. You know, I want to ask you about your evolution as an artist, as a creator, because this is something that we can see clearly in Photo Booth, but the creator side of you doesn't come out near as much in Long Red Hair. I mean, it's a it's a story of your growth, your evolution, your development, your, your, your finding a sense of who you are, but art is... Even though it's in there, it doesn't seem to be as prominent as it was in Photo Booth. And I'm wondering if you made a conscious decision to keep the Megs as artist figure out of long red hair. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think it was so much a conscious choice as it was just a matter of uh, only having 96 pages to work with. So um, with long red hair, I do feel somewhat odd about it being called a graphic memoir, which it is, but it just sort of feels like memoir is this heavy word and it's just your whole life. And, and it's, um, a little bit ridiculous to me to think that I'm writing my memoirs at 28 years old. You know, um, I intend to have a lot more life ahead of me. Uh, so when people read it and they think that it reflects my entire experience or my entire experience, either being bisexual or pansexual, queer, what have you, um, you know, it, it's actually, they have to remember that it's such a tiny sliver. The book is made up of 12 stories and then a, a 13th story for the, um, the epilogue. And I could have written a book with a very similar message, if not the same message by just selecting 12 different stories um, so there's, there's so, I have a lot of material to mine, I guess is what I'm saying. And so you have to be pretty selective when you're, when you're trying to condense stories into that, into that size, into that scale, but what you're going to tell. You know, I, I don't think that it's uh, strange at all that someone as young as you, uh, would have a memoir already because in long red hair, it seems that you, I mean, it's clear to me that you kind of map out a particular period of your life. It's like, okay, between 1992 and 2015, this is – these are some of the things that I went through, and mm-hmm. these are events, feelings, thoughts, experiences that have contributed to my sense of my identity, who I am now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so why not contain that even even as young as you are? Yeah, and I, I think that it's um... – Everything that I'm sharing, I, I'm sharing because I think, you know, is a valid experience and an experience that um, I think others could see themselves in uh, and that they could relate to. And so it's, it's important to share for that reason. Um, but I also just know that I've got a whole lot of life ahead of me and there's a whole lot of things in my past that were extremely formative that are not mentioned at all in Photo Booth or in Long Red Hair. So there's, that's just a nice way of saying that I've got more comics to come. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> It's interesting that you described the segments in Long Red Hair as stories because I hadn't thought of this as a series of individual stories. But you're right. Um, I mean you can read them that way. And I'm curious in terms of the chronological arrangement of these different stories or segments, you don't take a straight um, chronological – uh, approach to the story. Uh, there are times where you jump forward and then jump back again. Um, had you considered different ways of taking those different times of your life and moving them around in such a way that maybe one would work better than another in telling your story? Well, it actually, um, I think for the reader, they kind of get this this feeling of, of movement through time, but the actual structure of the book is fairly straightforward in that it is just two chronologies. So uh, there's my childhood, and there are three, um, there are nine chapters in total about my childhood, and those are all written in pencil. And so those all uh, happen chronologically, and those all unfold that way. Um, and every three childhood stories, there's an adult chapter. Uh, so there's a, there are three adult chapters in total plus the epilogue, which is also an adult chapter and the adult chapters are all done in ink. So it sort of, um, takes the the reader out of the sort of softness and the, the feeling of memory that I wanted to evoke in the, in the childhood stories. So both are linear within their own spectrum. It's just that they are uh, integrated into each other that way. And it's in the adult segments that we have your friend, uh, the aforementioned Elise. Mm-hmm. 
and it, does she um, does she appear in all of those later, more adult sections? Uh, yeah, she appears in all of them except for the um, the epilogue. The epilogue. Yeah, and so she is sort of the the grounding character, and and she's someone that is um, a very good friend of mine, one of my best friends. Um, she's also a reoccurring character in photo book biography, um, though she in that book it goes by her real name, so there's a bit of a, a shift uh, there, but. Um, she's someone who I haven't lived in the same city as, uh, since I was in high school. And so I have been able to mark different times in my life based on sort of the feeling of catching up with her whenever I did get to see her. Um, and so the, the book sort of captures these conversations that we've had over the years as we've, um, both individually grown and, and, you know, become young women. Now, We've mentioned uh, photo booth a number of times, so let, let's get to that. I'm curious about the transition from photo booth to long red hair. Um, was a more personal story that that we find in long red hair something that you had wanted to do even when you were making photo booth, or did the idea for long red hair occur while you were making or after you made photo booth? Um, I had started to get the ideas for some of the stories I wanted to tell in long red hair while I was still working on photo booth. And I had to really repress that urge because like, no, 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 you just have to finish this huge book that you already are working on. Um, photo booth for the readers that don't know is 280 pages. And so it was a much bigger endeavor. And, um, and so I really had to just sort of push those, those stories out of my mind until I had time. And then when I finally did have time, once I was wrapping up the tour for photo booth, I, I had to ask myself, why are these stories feeling relevant now? Um, you know, these are, these are moments in my life that I have always been able to think back to, but why, why do I have this urge in me to, to tell them now at this time? Um, and I think that, uh, one of the, the things that you often hear as a writer is that, um, you should write what you know. And I think that I did that with photo booth in many ways, but another way to approach writing is, um, write what you crave to understand. And I think that's really what I, that was, that reflects the process that I had writing long red hair, where I, I had some sort of unresolved things within myself that I wanted to, to put out onto paper and, and spend some time thinking about. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when we reviewed photo booth, a biography on the comics alternative blog last year, one of the things that immediately struck me was your choice of the subtitle. A biography. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm wondering what your decision process was in coming up with that instead of an another subtitle that may be descriptive in another manner. Yeah, I thought about that uh, for a while. So I should say that um, if there were no other booths, or no other booths, if there were no other books titled Photo Booth, then I probably just would have had that be the title. But um, there are other books that already named that. Um, and so for search reasons, I wanted to to give it something to distinguish itself. Um, and so as I was thinking about it, I, I didn't want to say, you know, photo booth, a history, um, because to me, it's so much more than a history because I really have in so many ways created what feels like a very human connection to these machines and, um, have, have really felt the personality of all these individual booths that I've used around the world. Um, specifically I'm speaking about these vintage chemical machines that actually have these mini dark rooms in them. So not the newer digital kind that we can find everywhere now. And, um, and so I really wanted to, to capture the story of them. Um, part of it is also so when you write a biography about somebody, it's also usually reflecting that their, their life is coming to an end or has come to an end. And that felt timely with photo booths because these chemical machines are, and, uh, have have largely disappeared from from our popular landscape. And, and I, again, I find it interesting the the choice of biography because usually biography is of an individual's life, not the life of a phenomena, an object, an, an inanimate um, uh, topic like you know a photo booth. But because this is such a personal topic for you, why not personalize it? Yeah, because I, I did feel like I was writing about a friend, you know, and so many times in my travel and research to write that book, I um, I felt like I was writing about a friend and that I, I would be brought to tears by being so frustrated at times with the machines. Um, 
at times with the actual machines and at times around the story surrounding them. You know, it, it's really hard to love something as much as I love photos and then to know that they're disappearing and you can't really have much say in that. So in some ways it's sort of like having a relationship with somebody who has a terminal illness um, or having this connection with say an animal that, you know, is going extinct. Um, some people, you know, may feel weird about me using that kind of language, of course, because it's, um, that's, you know, words we use for living things, but somewhere in my brain a long time ago, the wires got crossed. And I, I think of photo booths pretty similarly to, to th- how I think about my relationships with actual living people. Mm-hmm. Well, you actually do give, let's say, many biographies of people who had actually lived, such as, you know, the inventor Anatole Josefo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, so those are embedded in that narrative as well. Yeah, absolutely. So there are a lot of actual people who are also in the book. It's not just me talking to a bunch of uh, mechanical parts or anything like that. Um, there's there's some incredible real life stories behind the invention of the photo booth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, earlier I had mentioned that Photo Booth, the biography, is very much your story as well. So it, it, it's kind of a strange hybrid, you know, history, short biographies, but it's also a very personal story about you and your relationship with Photo Booth. So for those who haven't yet picked up Photo Booth and are curious about this hybrid mix, um, you know, explain or describe your relationship with Photo Booths. Uh, well, I started using photo booths when I was a teenager in high school, um, and there were two machines that were in this mall that I had to go through in order to catch the bus on the way home from school. And so many days after school, I would just um, just take a portrait of myself, take a strip, and I started documenting my everyday experience this way. So sometimes I took in elaborate costumes and props and additional lighting and that kind of thing and, and really made you know an art project out of it as a, as a form of creative expression. But other times I just simply wanted to to validate my day, you know, and by having this permanent record, this little photo or strip of photos, uh, it just sort of proved to myself, like, I still exist. I'm here, which um, can sound sort of dramatic. But as a teenager, you know, I I had an angst ridden world and and that was really important to me. So um, these machines were just always there for me, whether I was feeling ecstatic in one wanted to document how happy I was or whether I was really upset and just had my heart broken by somebody and I wanted to take a photo of how upset I was and, and, and record that day. Um, and so now as an adult, I have all of my photo booth pictures still. I have the um, date and location written on the back of all of them and I have them in these huge binders and clear plastic sheets. And so I have almost 9,000 individual photos. Um, so as time went on, photo booths became uh, a lot bigger because I started to find out that I was not the only person who was obsessed with these machines. Um, and in fact, there was actually a pretty large community of people I found online who were making artwork with them and who were dedicated to their preservation. So from there, my my life with them really um, snowballed where I got more and more involved uh, to the point where I was giving up every other aspect of my life for an opportunity to, to work more with these machines and, and to become more entrenched in that community. And so that's where this this book came from. And you became known, uh, you know, with your friends as Photo Booth Girl. Yeah, I'd say since the time I was fifteen, I've been like the Photo Booth Girl to a lot of people. And so now I think I'm I'm probably upgraded to Photo Booth Woman. <laughs> um, for, <laughs> for for a while, I was sort of like the Photo Booth Girl, like the sort of this endearing sweetheart of the community because I was this kid who was super gung ho. But yes, now I'm 28 and I've earned my stripes from the community, and obviously wrote this book for the community. Uh, and sort of as a, a love letter slash eulogy to the machines, and so I, I'm um, I'm no longer that sweetheart. I'm, I'm instead this this jaded woman who's sad about losing her life partner. <laughs> yeah, and with red hair. Yes, and with my red. Hair. Yeah. yeah. You know, as you were describing your relationship with photo booths and, you know, you would write down, you would have the photos and then you'd write down the place and the time of where they uh, were taken. You know, I couldn't help but think of uh, the question, well, who needs a Facebook wall if you have those? Which leads me to to an observation that that I found absolutely fascinating uh, regarding photo booth. And, you know, you point out more than once in the book that, you know, your love of photo booths 
happened before the advent of, let's say, social media being, you know, mm -hmm. ever present, and and more importantly, I think, um, smartphones, uh, portable devices where people. Uh, photograph themselves, selfies, you know, they share them online, they share them with, you know, with, uh, you know, texting others. So this is basically the photo booth phenomena for you was what now has become, I guess, um, portable devices, social media, smartphones, selfies, all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I graduated high school in 2005. And none of that stuff had exploded yet. You know, like I first got Facebook in 2007. And so this was still a time, you know, in my, in my high school years, like I had never used a digital camera. So, um, having a photo that immediately was still extremely special, you know, I, otherwise I was like begging my mom if I could use the camera and her expensive film. And then if we could wait two weeks for it to get developed. <laughs> um, and so to be able to take these pictures and have them almost right away was still really magical. And, and so that was the context in which I fell in love with photo booths. Um, and I think that there's, there's a lot I love about taking a picture, about having to, to plan your four shots or deciding to just be spontaneous and then having to wait for it and having that sort of delayed gratification. Um, and also not knowing how it's going to turn out. So with a photo booth strip, you can't edit it. You know, there's no weird filters that you put on it later. There's no apps to make you look thinner. Um, you can't take a thousand pictures and then delete the 90 or 999 that you don't like. Like you just, it just captured you that day and in that moment. And it's an honest reflection of, of both how you were that day and how well the machine was working that day. Um, so all of those things always felt very authentic to me compared to all this social media stuff and, and phones and apps and all of that, um, that has, you know, totally entrenched our culture now, which, which I all participate in and accept and all of that. But, um, I feel like going back to the photo booth and using it, I still use a photo booth once or twice a week. Um, all of that really kind of grounds my, my relationship to reality. You still to this day use photo booths. Yeah. So I'm very lucky because here in Montreal, where I live, um, the people who own all of the chemical photo booths across Canada have their headquarters here. And so we have more chemical photo booths, uh, these color machines left here than anywhere else in the world. And so it's, I still have to go out of my way to often use them. Um, there's not nearly as many as there used to be, but I can still find them in the Metro systems and in some shopping malls. Um, and so I'd say, yeah, once or twice a week, I make a point of going and, um, then just I scan that strip into my computer, write the, the date and location on the back of it, and then put it in my, my big binder. Hmm. Yeah, so it, it's sort of this ongoing visual diary that I have of my life that, you know, one day I'll be able to hand off to my granddaughter or something and say, like, you know, here is here is my entire life in, in, in photographs. Which is actually something that would be the way you're describing this more tangible, which is different from people doing all of this online, let's say on Facebook or on Tumblr. I mean, how do you pass something like that down to someone else? Oh, here's my URL. Yeah. Well, something I think about, and maybe this is going to sound sort of paranoid, but something I, I think about often is um, how, you know, it's great if I want to back up my files, my image files from my vacation on a USB or a hard drive or on some cloud somewhere. Um, but who's to say that a hundred years, 200 years into the future, anyone's going to know how to read a JPEG, um, you know, the way that we're, we're dealing with technology now, it changes so quickly. And so, you know, if, if how we read files completely changes, or if there's some sort of huge magnetic wipeout that happens and all of our computers get fried across the world, you know, archeologists of the future won't have much of a visual record from this period in time where we're producing so much content and some of it just, so much of it just lives on a screen. Um, so I actually sat, I know this sounds paranoid, but I feel like protected in that I have a hard copy, you know, visual representation of my life. Um, and, and yeah, who, who's to know, like if Instagram one day is just going to shut down and we'll lose all those photos that you didn't back up that you, you know, feel so attached to. So, this is sort of my own little um, private collection that I that I have for myself and for future generations. 
Hmm. Well, let me ask you, I mean, what, what do you feel your relationship is with social media? Uh, it's sort of a begrudging one. <laughs> I, I really love being able to connect with people that I wouldn't otherwise get to meet. And so I have met some um, incredible people online, like this international photo booth community. Um, and it's how I stay in touch with my best friends who live in all different cities around the world and my sister who lives in Tokyo and, and all of that. So I think ultimately it's a very positive one, but I also am pretty aware of how quickly I can start to feel like wrapped up in the, um, well, like how many followers do I have? How many friends do I have? How many likes did they get? All of those things, which, uh, can be very consuming if you, if you give it too much attention. So I, um, I want to make myself as available as possible online so that people know that I want to hear from them. I love to hear from, from readers and I love to hear their personal stories um, but I also try to keep, uh, sort of like an, you know, an arm's length kind of relationship with how much I actually care about any specific platform. And plus it strikes me that your relationship with photo booth photos, uh, are, are much more personal in that you, you're not, you know, broadcasting this stuff, uh, or all of it to the world. And in that way, it's, it's like a little part of you that, you don't put out there, which, you know, on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, which is what anyone can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's actually, um, it's very nice. And it's also a very deliberate choice in this time to, to keep some things private, you know, and in that way, I think keeping them more sacred. Have you been accused of being kind of a a young old fuddy duddy, uh, in privilege, (laughs) hard copy photograph? Um, I don't know. No one has ever been so bold to accuse me of that, but like, I absolutely am. Um, I think in almost every other area of my life, I am very progressive and very pro change. And, um, and I, yeah, I'm a, a pretty liberally minded individual, but I have to say with this one thing, I'm like the old curmudgeon in the corner. That's like, Oh, things used to be better than they are now, you know? And just really like, I, I have my own issues <laughs> that I that I have to sort of get over. I'm like the last person to adopt any new technology. Um, and I yeah, I hold off for as long as I can to the point when I finally do adopt it that like it's it's just not cool or relevant anymore. Okay. So I, I am not a trendsetter in that regard. So pretty soon are you gonna be yelling at kids to get off your Facebook wall? Uh I don't think <laughs> I have to because I think Facebook has apparently already become up uncool i uh i met this really awesome 13 year old girl at uh at a party and uh she's an aspiring illustrator and so we sat and chatted for a while and i was like oh well let's become facebook friends she's just like oh i don't use that (laughs) and so we became instagram friends instead but still um i was like oh okay i'm i'm you know aging out of what is cool i'm not the target demographic for most things anymore which is totally fine by me you know, this is this is interesting because uh, I have a couple of kids, one in college and one in high school. But even, you know, years before, um, they didn't really use Facebook much at all, which I found a little puzzling at first. Uh, now, I, I currently teach at University of Texas at Dallas, and uh, one of the classes that I teach is – social media in writing for, for digital communication. So I'm, I have my finger on the pulse of at least the college age generation and what they privilege in terms of social networking sites. And even though everyone, almost everyone has a Facebook page, I've been fascinated by the fact that that's not a platform that they usually prefer. It's usually something that's more image based like Instagram or Tumblr um, or, you know, if, if it's an app, uh, then something like Snapchat. Mm-hmm. And I feel, yeah, I, uh, Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say, and, and, and along with that, uh, the creative individuals and, and, you know, most of my students are arts and technology people. And, but I found that the, the, the arts oriented, uh, tend to gravitate toward those kind of visual social networking platforms like Tumblr, because that's where they put a lot of their art. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I don't have a Tumblr, and I see that it's been really wonderful for so many of my uh, friends who are comics creators, and it you know it's such a good platform for people to to follow them and for them to follow others. But um, 
personally, the reason why I don't have it is because I just don't want to feel committed to another thing to update. And, um, and, and part of sort of my, my life philosophy is to spend as little time as possible in front of the computer, um, which is totally ironic because when I set out to, to become an illustrator and, you know, a comics creator, I was like, great, I get to draw all day. And then I realized really quickly, like, no, I got to spend all my time like researching on the computer and then doing layouts on the computer and then drawing for a bit and then scanning and editing in the computer and then doing book design on the computer. And so I actually spend all my time already in front of the computer, but I don't need to add another, um, another platform on top of, on top of what I'm already juggling. So anyway, that's just me being an old grumpy pants, but I think that it's great that those things exist out there for, for people who enjoy them and use them. Oh, no, I, I admire the fact that you don't want to jump down that rabbit hole of yet another platform to update. Because I can tell you, as, as a podcaster, that's something that I'm trying to get the word out there as many places as possible, and that can be time-consuming. So you've made a wise decision. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, you know, I want, I want to come back to Long Red Hair because you were just talking about yourself uh, as a cartoonist. And in Long Red Hair, we do see you drawing occasionally. Um, when did you first get the itch to produce comics? Um, well, I, I was writing and illustrating my own stories from the time I was probably five or six. And I remember um, – like illustrating the story and then going to my mom and saying, um, like write out the sentence for me on a piece of paper and then I'll copy that sentence onto this page, you know, at a time before I knew how to, to write words myself. Um, and so I have some of those stories. They're, uh, very, uh, heteronormative. <laughs> they all have to do with, you know, uh, a poor young girl becoming a princess and then meeting a prince and they fall in love and they have kids and they die, but then their kids go on to fall in love with other people. Anyway, there are these, uh, you know, elaborate, uh, stories that have a lot to do with, um, monarchy. And, uh, and so I, I think that's always been a natural impulse for me. Um, I also do and teach, uh, improv theater. And so storytelling is also something that's come very naturally to me because of all my training in that field. Um, but as far as actually setting out and saying, I'm going to make this, this book or complete this, you know, full comics project, um, uh, that's, that's relatively new in my life. So I had for a long time wanted to make a book and I've actually, uh, scripted many books that will probably never get made. Um, because when it came right down to it, I always, I looked at how much time it would take me to be like, okay, you know, it's a minimum of six hours per page for the artwork. And, uh, and then did the math and just thought like, no, like as much as I enjoyed writing the script and as much as I think it would be an awesome story, you know, I just can't, I, I just can't d devote one full time year of my life to making it. It just was too absurd. Um, so in that sense, I was just in a comics appreciator for a long time, not a creator. Um, meanwhile, though, I was working, uh, as a freelance illustrator. So I, I had some of that skill set. And then finally with photo booth, that was like the push I needed to actually making a book because the, the reason for making the book was so much greater than myself. You know, it wasn't just because I thought it would be neat to make a comic. It was because I really wanted to get this message out into the world about the historical significance of photo booths and the impact that they still make um, in a time when you could still theoretically find a chemical photo booth to use. Um, so, and, and so that really felt like I had a, a clock on me and, um, a community around me who is really looking to me to, to ensure that I actually did make the book I said I would make. And so with all of that extra pressure, I, <laughs> I did make the book um, with all those external circumstances. So once photo booth was made, it was a tremendous amount of work, but once it was made, that kind of um, lifted the, the veil off of like how you make comics and how you get comics published. And so that's, so I fell into making long red hair very, very easily. Um, I essentially just told my publisher I'd had this, uh, my publisher is conundrum press for both books. And, uh, so I just, I spoke with my publisher, Andy and, um, said like, look, I've got this idea for, for a book. I think it'll be called long red hair. It kind of has stories like this. And I said, would you be interested in publishing it? And he said, sure. You know, and so, and we signed a contract the next week. Um, so it was a, a much more casual approach, um, then, you know, when you're, when you're on the outside and you're unpublished, it can be, can be hard to, to break in. But, um, so anyway, it, it felt very natural, uh, after photo booth to just continue making comics. And so 
um, I'm doing, yeah, I'm continuing to do that. So I, I have an idea for a, uh, a next big book. Um, I know what that book will be. I don't have a title for it yet. Uh, and so I'm just in the early research stages of that. And it'll also be historical and journalistic and autobiographical. Um, and uh, in the meantime, before that comes out, I'm just going to be very happy to be doing, um, you know, short comics for anthologies and for websites and magazines and that kind of thing. Hmm. Now, you were saying, you know, without giving too much away, of course, that your next project is going to be – uh, something that has, you know, some relates to your life, uh, history. So the kind of thing that you were doing a little bit with Photo Booth, a little bit what you're doing with Long Red Hair. Um, have Have you had any thoughts of uh, doing any fictional narrative? Um, yeah. So I, I published my, or actually it, it's coming out soon, but I, I finished my first um, fictional comic. It's just eight pages for a Canadian magazine here called Tattle Creek. And that's coming out in, in early December, so pretty soon. And uh, that's set in a total, you know, other world, different dimension, a uh, whole other universe. And that was tremendously fun to write. And um, if you read it, you'll probably get that it's an allegory uh, for for government, and uh, and you'll see all that. And so. I, I try to get overly political in my works because I want them to feel accessible to a wide audience, but I certainly am a political person. So I'm just sort of, my plan is to sneak those messages into fictional comics uh, so that I, that I still express that voice. Um, so yeah, I do, uh, I do want to explore fiction, um, but we'll, we'll see which one that takes. Hmm. Now, earlier you had mentioned the work that you do in improv, and you described yourself in improv as, as a storyteller. So I'm wondering about the way that your background in improv informs your work in comics. Um, I think that it, it uh, greatly informs it, but in a way that's really difficult to measure. So um, I have no formal writing background whatsoever. So I went to school for drawing and then later for graphic design. And um, no one ever really sat down and, and said, you know, here's how you construct a story. Um, and, you know, the most kind of things that I, that I wrote in my undergrad were uh, research papers and long essays. And, and for a long time, I thought I would do a master's in art history. And so I all of those research tools became very essential in crafting photo with biography. Um, but I did no creative writing in, in school. And so, um, all along though, I, I've been doing improv theater since I was 14. And so all along, I think I have been learning story structure, um, and, and what an audience needs to hear from you and what you can give to an audience, um, for my work on stage. So, so often when people hear improv, they think of kind of uh, short skits, kind of whose line is it anyway. Um, and I do do that kind of stuff, but that's not really the improv I'm, I'm speaking about. Um, the improv that I do uh, primarily is called long form narrative. And so those are, are long pieces that are sort of like improvised plays. So anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour and you are improvising a whole story with beginning, middle and end and, and things tie together thematically and, and, it's very challenging to do because, of course, you don't know where you're going with your teammates, but you all have to be on the same page. And so after years of, of, of working on that, I think that's, that's how I learned how to, how to tell a story, even you know, on the page in comics form. Now, if someone goes to your website, I mean, they can find out about your background in performance, and and I find that interesting because improv, unless I'm missing something, in no way really appears in long red hair. Yet this is something that you've been doing since you were a teenager. Yeah, it um, it didn't the improv didn't feel so relevant um, to long red hair and to those stories, so it it doesn't get captured in there. Though it does a little bit with photo booth, um, and. But I also think part of that is that like improv is a very hard thing to put down on paper. And so it would be really difficult to capture in comics form. Um, another thing that I do is I um, train in aerial arts. I do aerial silks and trapeze. And uh, and that's that's a pretty big part of my life that I, I do those things a few times a week. But it's also really hard to, uh, to write about because it's all about movement and uh, the sort of adrenaline rush you get and... and um, and pushing these boundaries in a way that it's actually 
for me so far, I found it has been hard to, to capture all of those things on, on the flatness of a page. And if someone wanted to see your performances, where would they go? Um, so I perform um, nearly every week with Montreal Improv Theater here in town. And I also travel very regularly um, with one of my groups called Quest of, the Dra- Quest of the Dragon King. And we do fantasy narratives. We're super geeky. And um, and so maybe that's why I don't have to do fantasy so much in my comics, because I get it out on stage. Uh, and so we toured um, the northeastern United States last year, and we're going to be doing a tour again this summer. And, and I also regularly attend um, improv festivals in other cities. So I, I'm pretty busy on that end too. But um, I don't. I think of it as sort of like my my playground. It's something that I that I go to to have a, a social release from the very uh, isolating world of making a comic at your at your desk by yourself. Yeah. Now you mentioned the the group that uh, you're a part of, Quest of the Dragon King. I couldn't help but think, uh, again, coming back to Long Red Hair, of what you write about your family's relationship with Dungeons and Dragons and how they mm-hmm. introduced you to that. Yeah, so I began uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons with my family at a very young age, when I was about six. And so uh, a lot of that uh, comes out on stage. So I use all this sort of background knowledge that I have of of spells and of mythical creatures and fantastical lands um, out on stage. So it's a, it's a fun release for all of that. Hmm. Now, now, Megs, if our listeners wanted to find out not only more about your books, but uh, your performance and just the, the, the stuff that you do, period, uh, where would they go to, to find that information? Uh, so you can go to my website, megsfitzgerald.com. Uh, Megs is spelled M-E-A-G-S. Not the most intuitive way, but I am the only Megs Fitzgerald on the internet with that name. Uh, and I'm also fairly active on Instagram, uh, somewhat active on Twitter, and I also have a professional Facebook page that you can like called Two Hands, Two Crowns, and that's where I post all my illustration work. So even though I said earlier that I begrudgingly use social media, I, uh, I, I am on all of those things, and I do love to, to connect with people there. And what was that last pl- platform again? Uh, oh, on Facebook as Two Hands, Two Crowns. Okay. Um, well, Megs, I want to thank you very much for taking the time and talking with me, and it's been a pleasure. I enjoyed meeting you the other month at uh, SPX, and I'm glad we got the time to have a longer, more leisurely conversation. Yeah, thank you so much, Derek. I really appreciate it. So there you go. I had a great time talking with Megs, and uh, that that was... uh, that was good. Uh, we covered a lot of ground there, some things that I hadn't expected, but um, because it, it, it's, a, it's a very personal book, um, Long Red Hair, and uh, she was very comfortable talking about all of it. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, and I'm glad you had a chance to kind of expand on having after you met her at SPX. Yeah, so uh, it's definitely something to check out. And in fact, if you guys out there want to get a copy of Long Red Hair or even her previous book, Photo Booth, A Biography, you know you could do so by going to comicsalternative.com slash Amazon. And if you click on that link there, and you cannot miss it on that page, it'll take you right to Amazon.com. And everything you get through that click-through, if you do your shopping uh, on Amazon.com, we get a few cents kickback, and kickbacks are always good things. Yes, we like to get kicked back. That's right. That's right, in that way. And if uh, or when Megs has future books coming out, well, you can pre-order them through the sponsor of the podcast, and that's Discount Comic Book Service. So if you go to their website, dcbservice.com, you'll find how many great specials they have every single month. Then after you do get your comics there, please get in touch with us and let us know the kind of things you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll see that you can leave us a voice recording through SpeakPipe. It's very simple and easy to use. Or you can call us over the phone. Our phone number is 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. 
That's right. Or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And we also have our Twitter feed where we announce new content to the podcast as well as updates to the blog. You can check out our Twitter feed at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Instagram, on Google+, on Pinterest, and on YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, you can stream us on Stitcher, and you can find us on TuneIn, and you can find, as always, every single one of our episodes, as well as our reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, and that's at comicsalternative.com. That's right, all the ways to get a hold of us and let us know how we're doing. Yeah, and we like hearing from you. Until next time, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.